I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I don't have my mic on right now, but we'll be over here as a panel discussion. Maybe we should roll uh, our chairs up so everyone can address everybody. Maybe we should roll our chairs up. And, take and uh, basically, it's going to mostly be a question and answer session so over exams and software, and notebooks, desktops, and web based uh, exam administration, all the fun stuff. Uh, I think Greg has a, a short introduction to some of the technology. Is that right? So if you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we'll just basically after that, I will give a Quick little history. I've had my school I actually don't use. Mm -hmm. I use uh, all my exams are actually administered on notebooks on site, but we don't use exam software. So I'm just going to give a quick little two minute speech on why we don't and how we got to that point. Then we'll open it up and kind of start around some questions and stuff. So, if again, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Greetings, uh, Greg Sarab. My company is Xtegrity, and we make a product called Exam 4.0. It's exam software. Um, you've read about it in the, in the um, outline for this uh, for this session. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, and I just wanted to take a, a minute to uh, to show you uh, very quickly how easy it is to install and run, and just what it looks like. And I promise I will only take a few seconds. Anybody that wants to talk to me, obviously afterwards. Uh, I'll be here. So um, when you, uh, when a student uh, requests the software, they fill in a brief registration form on our website, and they will get back an email with the application customized for them, and uh, the, the uh, installation procedure is as follows. Um, can I get somebody to time this? Because we've been working on getting this a little bit quicker. OK, ready? OK, thanks. How long was that? Was it three? Damn. In any event, um, they're ready to go. This is installed and good to go. Um, so they would start a new exam here. Uh, on this screen, they would enter the course title. Um, well, I'll just put in gibberish, although I didn't do well in that class. Um, and if they choose to use their name, it asks them if they're sure, and uh, which is nice, because then we don't have the problem that Eric Noble was talking to me about last week, where they accidentally get their name if that's not what they wanted. And then here they'd set the time for the exam. This is just a timer that it records the time on its own. Some alerts. Um, here's our notice page. So they can't say they didn't know how it works. Even if they don't read it, they have to sign off with their initials. So funny that their initials are the same as the course title. I wonder how that's going to play. And then here we, um, we have a way to uh, get them. Uh, this is a secured uh, start code. It just means that you're giving them a code, a password code, that only your school has. And this is keyed to a, uh, uh, another password that allows you to decrypt these exams. Um, encryption and decryption is the way that we keep uh, anybody from getting access to their materials after the exam is over. And again, this, is pretty, this should be pretty familiar if you've been working um, with, uh, well, and then familiar or not familiar, it's just a plain old password. It's nothing, it's nothing exotic. So let me just put one in. Uh, or, uh, my favorite one is whale. Oops, I spelled it wrong. Um, that doesn't work. So they can't go anywhere other than where they're supposed to go, even by accident. And that's helpful when people are stressed. Um, and then uh, a real basic word processor screen, um, uh, character count and a word count, and, you know, that's really all there is to it. Um, when they're done, they, it prompts them they're required to save to a floppy disk, and then I have another application that helps you get those, those files off the disk and printed. Um, it's all one button stuff. Everything is very explained and laid out, and um, I think that's plenty of time for me. Thank you, Greg. Okay. I'll let everybody introduce themselves. I didn't do a very good job of that. If we can start off on my far left here. I'm Doug Winnick with Software Secure. Um, you want to introduce yourself? You want me to launch in? Don't you want to tell them some more about yourself? No, I, I, I'm about <laughs> You're to You're a special that. person. Thank you <coughs> very much. Uh, uh, well, go ahead, Doug. That's okay. Software Secure is a Boston-based company. Uh, we're three years old. We specialize in exam-taking software. We have two products, Secure Exam Student and Secure Exam Browser. Uh, I'll give you a very brief 
sort of background about the company and our products. Um, if it's something that truly interests you, I suggest you go down and take a look at our demos downstairs. I think we'll probably be best served today for this panel if we can answer whatever questions you have. Um, secure Exam Student simply provides students a secure environment in which to take either essay formatted exams or objective exams. Uh, we use a Microsoft Word platform. Um, we started out in the <clears throat> higher education market, primarily in college institutions, where the predominant word processor is Microsoft Word, and students were looking for the comfort of Word. Um, I know that could be an issue with some law schools that are Word Perfect users, uh, but we'll deal with it as the issue arises. We also have a Secure Exam Browser product, which is a security wrapper that locks up any course tool you might use, any web-based course tool. So if you have a proprietary testing product or even a quizzing product, we can lock that up. And if you use any other commercial applications, we also lock those up. Um, we work with schools in a variety of different markets. As I said, college market is probably our largest, K through 12 business schools and now law schools as well. Um, and that is about it. We are deploying our product in a variety of settings, in laptop schools, in computer labs, as an optional way of taking tests. So we have developed uh, quite a bit of expertise in deploying the software and supporting a variety of platforms. So I welcome any questions you might have and any assistance we can provide. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm Adam Wasserman. Uh, uh, nice to see all of you. I am uh, the executive vice president and co-founder of ExamSoft Worldwide. ExamSoft Worldwide is five years old. Uh, we have approximately 30 employees, and we're based out of Southern California and South Florida. Uh, we've administered over half a million uh, law school and bar exams alone in uh, 43 of the states of this country. Uh, people use our services to administer any types of tests that they want, be it multiple choice, essay, uh, true, false, fill in the blank, etc. Uh, one thing we stress about ExamSoft is that we understand that giving exams on computer is just not um, a security issue. While security is a very big part of this process, there are many more dimensions to giving exams, uh, which deal with students' anxiety, preparation, and administration. Uh, so we address uh, this from a 360-degree perspective, beginning with making sure the student's computer is set up properly and they know how to use the program, uh, making sure that your exams start on time, and then making sure the content from the exams can be published and distributed in ways that uh, only your faculty can come up with. Um, I'm also here to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, again, I'm Gary Banks. I'm at the University of Virginia. I was asked to sort of sit on the panel, I think, because I, I our school has not uh, deployed any of the software. Uh, I thought the best way to kind of explain that would be to simply you know, give a history of how we've sort of not gotten into the end of the game. Uh, as early as 91, 1990, we had a few professors who saw the advantages that we're all talking about now, which is just simply using a computer you know, to, to type up your answer and turn in a, a nice printout to read instead of having to go through that handwriting that you, know, you can't discern what they're saying. Um, and at University of Virginia, in combination with the honor code that we have there, they started a very small number of professors, I would say three in 91, started to develop a, a policy, an exam policy, that would let students use their desktop, because that's you know, the only place you could assure that the student would have access to a computer at that time, at their home, which meant off-site travel. I mean, up until that point, everything was clearly on-site on and with your old white book or blue book. So as they started thinking about going home, immediately the issue is, well, gee, that's travel time too. That's travel time back. That's modem. That's hard drive. And it's clearly unproctored. I mean, it's any number of environments where they might have their desktop set up. So from 91 through you know, 95, 96, they kept working on uh, the guidelines for their fellow professors of what an exam would have to be structured like, how it would have to be given. So it was a synthesis and evaluation test and not simply a simple knowledge-based test. Uh, and they had to come up with some guidelines and policies for administrators, you know, how to deal with a student who had a, a party breakout above their apartment when they were in the middle of the exam. And because you were going to have, you know, not a, very, not a consistent test environment that was fair and equal and equitable to everybody. What to do if you got behind a fire truck and there was an accident and, you know, I mean, they had to come up with all these guidelines. 
it clearly got to the point in 1996, if you can imagine, we were doing, I th I'm recalling this number off the top of my head, but about 85% of the 4,000 exams for these 1,100 students were off-site and on a desktop computer. So it was welcome to exam period, and boom, everybody jumped in their cars to rush to go home. Um, needless to say, this was not a small cadre of people then might have a tech support issue. And at that point, you know, I clearly cannot go 15 miles out into the mountains in a timely fashion and provide tech support. Uh, and it's clearly a stressful time. So you, you get where we go. We, we basically then instituted the requirement to own a notebook, not a new notebook. All we needed is somebody to own a notebook so that we could at least bring them back on site and start to drop some of the policies that we had developed for you know how to deal with travel time to and from and paper jams at home and stuff like that because you know when you're at home they turned in paper. So at that point, if you will, we clearly already had a policy and a culture and, and how to handle s stressful situations and on our issues, if you will, with the exam administration that having them on site with notebook was really a technical convenience and just as, you know, we, we stopped putting them in the cars and such. Um, I guess that's about the rest of the story. I, would, I, I always have to caution here, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a techie, I'm not student affairs, I'm not the registrar, so while I've been in on the policy making decision and all that. I don't know, all, I'm not on the academic review committees and I don't teach so I don't really have any, you know, pedagogical reasons I can sit here and talk to you about how we do it. I can just talk about how we do it technically. Yeah. Is it okay discussions? I think that's it. <laughs> yep. Um, so in other words, you guys took no technical safeguards in terms of uh, the locking on a hard drive. It was just totally under code with the students. Yes. You can use Word, WordPerfect. Uh, any word processor you want, uh, you can use Mac, you can use uh, IBM Wintel, and uh, you can turn in a uh, ASCII text file if you want. And uh, basically when the exam's done, we have these yellow envelopes, if you will, and you take your diskette, you stick it in there uh, with the exam, we collect it, we turn it around in 24 hours for the professor, uh, blind graded and the whole nine yards. So you take, the students turn in a disk. Yes. Um, at this time, we have two. I mean, in essence, yes. My, it's blind graded, so my office is the trusted in, uh, third party. So we collect the exams, and all we turn off to the professor is a blind uh, a piece of paper, the printout, with the blind grading number on it. Have you ever had a disk that you read? Oh, yeah. We have about a half a percent failure rate. What I mean there is at any one time, you'll clearly have at the last minute, you know, somebody who can't save to disk yet. They, you know, they're at the end of the exam period. So we'll have trouble tickets at the time when the exams are collected. Most of those are truly, I can't save, I've just lost my mind kind of things. Um, you know, or I, I forgot to save it to the hard drive. Or can you confirm that it's really on the disk yet? I just, you know, I, I don't believe it at the moment. So it's, a lot of that's just convenience where you just stand there and we look at the, you know, the students as they're collecting and turning in the exams. And then we have about that half percent where they turn in the blank disk yet. Um, but again, because we're turning them around in less than 24 hours, we have a technical database, an extensive intranet, so that as soon as publications, which is my crew, you know, they stick in a diskette if it's blank or they can't read the file or something like that, it's immediately plugged in to the database saying there's a techie problem. And again, with, with wireless technology, uh, we've gotten our notebook. It's very easy. The communication pathways are very quick, and they immediately are notified. We, we, we get them back. What are you doing? When an exam has a blank diskette, I haven't lost one yet. So it's always on the student's time. Yeah, we have a um, uh, tips, things you got to do, three things you have to do so I can help you when things go wrong. Um, basically, we require during the exam, if they don't do these things, they can get hosed, obviously. But and and some of them don't pay attention to my requirements as well. Don't get me wrong; they'll they'll hang themselves pretty far out there. Um, but pretty much what we do is we just tell them, have autosave turned on. If you don't know how to do it, read your manual. If you can't do that, come in, in two weeks before, you know, a week before, and make sure your autosave is on. This is a good computing tip regardless of exams, right? Then basically we say save it to the hard drive, and every 10, 15 minutes, you know, you take your deep breath. You're supposed to relax. Exam management, good practice, and you save it to the diskette. And if you put it on the diskette, you put it on the hard drive, and you got your autosave on, I'll bail you out. If they have a problem at any time, technical problem, uh, we have a, I'm sorry, I'm going on now into detail of the exam procedure. I'll uh, ask another question. Well, 
Well, I think the amazing thing, well, the amazing thing is just that uh, I can't imagine that students don't get very concerned that people could be che cheating. It makes it so easy to cheat. That that's right. the issue. And the difference between you and all these other kinds. Right. That's where I, you know, if I was a teacher, I could talk to you more about how I teach or how I structure my exam. I, they don't reuse exams, obviously. I mean, you know, the course of value, the courses, previous courses are no longer just on reserve. They can be on the web, on the secured website. But I can't, you know, I, I know how they're instructed to put, put an exam together. Uh, professors can clearly still make it closed book handwriting if they don't like it and they're uncomfortable. Um, you know, the expectation is that they can always request and require the notebook, but they can say no. Yes, ma'am. What percentage of the faculty use the system, and what percentage of the students do it? Because my sense would be that if you're looking at 75 or 90 percent of the students doing it, then it's different. Than, but if you're looking at 15 or 20 percent of the students doing it, then the sense of cheating or unfair advantage might be higher. So I was just curious what the, at this point, what the percentages are. Oh, all students take all exams on, on computers. I mean, they have a notebook requirement, and okay, they're all. So, so the school requires the students to have a notebook. Yes, you must own a notebook, okay. and you have to come on site. It, this was our last year where we actually had the third years that they were expected, they were told to be on site. But obviously, <coughs> they could go home and do it the old-fashioned way. But as of now, everything's on site with a notebook. But everyone, 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 all everyone classes, all. Yep. Yeah. And, and you catch them on the first year. First year, small sections. We require that one, you know, in our struct, our curriculum, there's one class as a first year where you get to be down to the small section, is what we call it, 30 people. And we require the professor to give a midterm, whether it counts for a grade or not for a grade. And I go in on that test day and I say, welcome, this is your test. It's a midterm, it's just you 30 and myself. And we go through the procedures and it's, it's their first chance to go through saving to the hard drive, saving to the diskette, here I am. If you have any questions after this, let's go through it. So it's the warm-up. I mean, you hit them the first time. Your staff must have it down to a fine T. I mean, it seems like the uh, people intensive uh, time on your people. You got all these discs being turned in. And you're having um, we print 4,000 exams. It's over an 11-day period, six days, Monday through Saturday. Uh, again, it's in all the course pages are... I'm sorry, this no, no. is not, not going well uh, as far as sharing. <laughs> um, it's public, it, it used to be publications for those who have been in law school. It used to be the publication secretarial pool who have grown up with me, right? So they know how to use the access databases and the internet. The course rosters are secured and right there with the blind grading numbers. And there's a little check box, a little radio box when it's received by the professor, printed successfully. Any tech notes, if they notice that the blind, you know, the blind grading number was illegible or the pledge wasn't signed, all those little trouble tickets are right there and immediately it kicks off an agent that escalates the, the cause. And they then notify the professor immediately when X number of exams and they check them back out. Here's your 60 exams. Given that it occurs within a 24 hour period, we hire currently two temps. But it's a very easy process. It's a good temp thing. Hi, open envelope, insert disk app, retrieve file, print, you know, next. <laughs> yes? Do, do you kind of update one of the examination software any time in the near future, or do you want to continue no. uh, doing your system? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we, we did it. Again, we developed and worked on the culture and how the administration and the students are expected to conduct themselves with the technology back in 92, 93, 94 time frame. Have you posted um, instructions for the students for the procedures on the web someplace? Oh, yeah, it's on the web. It's an email reminder that goes out two weeks before. It's uh, at the exam table in a big, you know, on a big purple sign. And I typically uh, will go with my wireless notebook and hang out at the exam table the week before a couple hours, you know, when they're doing class changes, because that's when they may actually start to, to pay attention to it and whatnot. Eric, I am. Yes, yes this is good. I'm just curious. Um, because, you know, what the New York Times published uh, three mm -hmm. weeks ago about cheating at the University of Virginia right. and that it's rampant and widespread. And, um, you know, there's a lot of schools that uh, have honor codes. And right. really, I mean, if an honor code's supposed to work, you don't need anything like this except for administrative purposes. So how does something like that play into the way your students feel about the way you treat them? Because there are a lot of students who want to make sure that people don't have an unfair advantage right. over them. And when something like that comes out, uh, whether it's true or not, 
Right. People feel a certain way. This is where I wish I was a teacher to understand it. I'm having to, again, I, I'm really backing out of it, but I don't, I haven't taught. And when I'm doing, when I'm in the classes, I'm not there to see if somebody actually is cutting and pasting whether that's allowed or not. I mean, I understand the principles of, principles of what the professors are instructed to how their exams are supposed to be, the exam instructions are supposed to be written. Um, the feedback I get is if they have three hours, it's a timed exam, it's on site, it's not just give me the facts back, multiple choice, where access quick, you know, instead of having to thumb through your class notes, they always used to tell you you could bring in books, and this is where it would be nice if I knew mm -hmm. the right books you're supposed to bring in for exams. It may be a little bit faster, um, you know, if you have your notes all online, but given that everybody has that equal opportunity and fair notice and it's been three years, mm -hmm. that's okay. You know, it's funny, you talked about people handing in blank discs. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times we give a bar exam and people hand in blank discs, nothing on it. And it used to be the presumption was the program ate the test, but now the presumption is the person didn't answer the question and didn't know what to do. And so what we had to find out in all these cases is that, yes, in fact, uh, these people never prepared an answer. They got to their bar exam and they just didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really curious, when something like that happens at your school, right. when there aren't redundancies or backups, is the presumption that the person didn't want to take the test or couldn't answer the test? Or no, the presumption the is that they goofed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, you can go in and you can take a look at undeleted files. You can take a look at, you know, I mean, unless they, I mean, obviously they can quickly get around any date time stamps and mm -hmm. they can go through and really modify their notebook. Mm -hmm. But the presumption is if at 5 p.m. they turned in, at 10 o'clock the next morning I have a blank diskette. I looked at the diskette to see if there's been any scratch activity to recover undeleted files. I mean, and very quickly you approach the student, you know, the, in our place, yes, it's assumed that when I'm talking to them the next mm -hmm. morning or so, and they say, here's a diskette, you say, on your honor, it's, this file's good, it's the same one as on the hard drive, they both match up in word count and stuff well, like Let that. me ask you this, how do you deal with people who accidentally delete part of their answers during an exam? And, and That's their issue. Your, yeah. So you don't give them any makeup no. time? Or... No, there's no accommodation. Mm -hmm. No, we don't give accommodations. If you go three hours and then you do a select all and you delete your entire file and you really match your problem. The student's problem, sorry. So you fail? Uh, meaning they're not going to turn an exam. It's not going to be a technical issue. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it gets into an academic review issue, whether there's an accommodation or a do-over. It would be akin to getting sick during the exam. That, that be Gary, can I have a question yes. for you and sort of follow up on that? Um, it seems to me there's two benefits to using software product like uh, like Adam's software or mine, mm -hmm. uh, not just the security but also the administrative uh, aspects of it. And it's and so what would be the arguments that uh, that your school would use against employing that kind of software simply on administrative grounds and uh, and the security aspect of it uh, just a side bonus? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any administrative concerns at this point. I mean, I basically, my orientation speech, I don't require them to buy a new notebook. I don't spec out a, a particular uh, um, notebook. It's, it's more an attitude. I, I'm there to advise them on what safe computing practices are. Here's a virus protector. I provide it for free. You get a wireless notebook, you can do it every, any time you want. You can get the update. That's my mantra from day one. Uh, if you're having a problem with a major vendor on your notebook, you've got to be able to communicate with them and, and then know how to escalate it. I can help you to escalate. That, that's my preventative proactive approach to the whole thing. So really, that just makes sense. I mean, I want them to be a good computer user uh, rather than, you know, me being dependent on me as their sole service provider. So I don't, if you put the security issues aside, I feel that if I tell them, you know, you're going to go in on a highly stressful, tired, coffee open next to the notebook, it's going to happen. And this is what's going to, here's how we're going to respond to you when you spill that water on your notebook. Where's your disk at? And at that point, you know, don't get me wrong, it's going to happen. Somebody's not going to do what I've asked them to do. But then it's not a technical response, if you will. That, that, that's, a, that's the academic side. I mean, at that point, I'm like, I can tell you, they said that. And, and they're very upfront if it happens. I wasn't backing up. I know I was supposed to, but that's, that's student affairs. That's an academic <laughs> review issue. Greg, I, I can answer your question um, because I, I've had the discussions with your deans and other deans of schools who have the same policy. There's three things why people say we don't want to use uh, software that, that gives the message we're going to stop you from cheating. 
the, the message is we have an honor code, and we respect that honor code. And while some people may choose not to respect it, we've built our school and our institution around that honor code. We've never proctored our exams. Right. Students have always been free to do what they want. And if we put something in the school that says, we're going to stop you from cheating, what we're doing is we're changing, I guess, the milieu of mm -hmm. the atmosphere so they don't do it. And uh, they also feel that our grads are going to get jobs no matter how they do on their exams if they come out of a certain law school. So the performance on their exams isn't as critical as uh, if they go to a different type of school. That, that's what I've got yeah, to remove about some pressure. That. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I, I better, let me, I, I've always been looking this way. I'll come back. Was there somebody over here? Because I'm turning my back on you guys. Well, I have a question. Yes, are, are most of the exams given at the same time as all the people taking constitutional law will be taking the same time? They'll take it whenever they like. Um, okay, again, I'm not the registrar, but I have, because I support it, I think I know. <laughs> Uh, all the first year classes that are, are required what we call fixed, meaning they all sit down and take them at the same time. Most of your upper level courses are flex scheduled, meaning the students have certain blocks, you know, in the morning, every morning, and they can pick them and take them in any order that they would like to. So that's where my tech support issue gets to be a little bit more complicated. I have to be geared up for any one time for 600 of my 1,100 students to decide Monday morning's a good time, and maybe 50 will show up. And that's a different scale, right, from the number of people to support. And if they start at different times, and not between 9 and 10, that means they finish between and different exam lengths. So I'm on call for a little bit, you know, larger time. So you take your exams in, you can take them whenever you want to, but you have to go to a classroom to take them? Just yeah, it has to be in classrooms, not in libraries, not in small seminar. I mean, there's restrictions on the, but it's on site if you're taking it, yeah. It is. But you have one exam table where any of your questions, it's your emergency desk, and they're told if they have the blue screen of death three hours into it or two hours. We don't go through what our triage is going to be. The idea is immediately come up to the desk. And the idea is if I'm there, I have access to the dean, I have access to the academic associate dean, we will take care of it. I mean, you know, life happens. This will happen. I have a question for Greg. Okay. Please do. Um, and I looked at your software late last year, and, and at the time, I don't know if it still is, it was a free download. Is that still the case? Yes, it's free, it's free right now, and it will be um, for the fall semester. All right, and, and you also, maybe I missed it, is it also a secure environment? Yes. You you are? Uh, Diana, I'm from Wyoming University. Okay. Yes, ma'am. question I have about soft security is yours, yours is worried it's all Windows applications up to NT 4.1. We use Office Suite 2000 and 97. And we support both Microsoft Word and Excel. Excel has really not been used for law school exams, but it's an option some people have been interested in for certain mm -hmm. kinds of calculations. Yeah, we had quantitative methods in a couple of places sure. that came up with wanting to use Excel. And so that blocks and you can't cut and paste the features of this from elsewhere other Word documents. Correct. They, they have all the functionality of their Word processor, Microsoft Word, within a secure exam. They can't cut and paste from the outside. We clear the buffers going in and on the way out. Uh, and they don't have access to anything outside any other application. It's the only application that's running. <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, <coughs> Uh, you might actually be better suited to answer that question. I, I don't know uh, Adam's functionality that well. I sort of focus on what we're doing. Um, we serve similar purposes, which is to provide a testing platform that's secure. Um, but I don't really keep track of what ExamSoft's providing. And, and likewise. And likewise. Yeah. But come on down and, you know, we're sitting next to each other. Is there a major cost Again, I, I couldn't tell you. Come, come talk to us afterwards. That, that's a good point. I'll start. Um, we provide schools with site licenses based on the number of students that are using the product. Uh, the price per student depends on the total volume, and it can be anywhere between $4 to $20 per student per year. We have a minimum user base in a school of 250 users. 
what would you do with a school that is a relatively small school that isn't going to have anywhere near that number of students? Um, the, the pricing for that is $10,000 a year. Did I say that right? No, $5,000 a year is our minimum license fee for 250 users. With that, we know we can provide you all the support you need to do two things. One is to do any kind of uh, faculty workshops and student workshops. Uh, any assistance you require for installation if you have a standard build or if you want to think about doing a standard build. Um, and around the clock customer support. Okay. Yeah. It might be helpful then. Yeah, we'll go ahead. In general. Um, our, our pricing really varies on student use. Um, and we have a schedule of pricing that commences with the first time you use the product to the second time you use the product, um, in some cases to the third time you use the product. Um, Giving a price, I give you a price, it's just not for a secure software to lock down the computer. Uh, when I give you a price, uh, you know, we also provide a, a complete web setup administration database for every school um, that installs the program, that makes sure the student's computer works with the program, that gives you access to see which students came to the site, uh, which allows you to send emails to all of the students, which allows you to do a whole lot of things. Um, the other side is we, we have a call center and uh, students can call uh, many t as often as they like on a, a no fee basis with very knowledgeable people that are by the way multilingual if any of your students are uh, multilingual. The, the cost to use ExamSoft your first time out with us is $2,500 and that's what we call pilot project. Uh, we really take the risk the first time because we go ahead and build this uh, secure web server for you uh, to go ahead and get your plan underway. We come to your school for one to two days and at our expense and we spend time with the faculty and the students. Uh, we provide you with a set of training CDs and demo CDs that you're free to use and distribute. Uh, and then we also provide support. That's the first time. After that, we charge a per student rate uh, per year. And that rate now is $30 per student for unlimited use of the program all year long. Um, and we have other pricing models. The bar exam pricing models are different. And if the program was to be used more frequently, we would talk about uh, other types of things. But uh, so you know, and I know, and some of our clients can attest, we realize that a lot of the public universities have budget constraints. Uh, in getting approval for dollars, and they just can't come up with $5,000, $10,000 off the bat. Uh, you can talk among yourselves. We don't turn people away, and we don't say you can't afford us, so we're not going to do business with you. Uh, for example, with the Georgia Bar, um, what the convention center was charging the Georgia Bar for electrical outlets per computer uh, was more than we charge for our software. They're charging them somewhere between 60, excuse me, $40 an electrical outlet just to plug it in, which they can afford. So what we've done is turned around and subsidized their cost, reducing the minimum cost of the program. Because we, we do know this is a pedagogical thing, but we're a business and we have to be able to pay our bills and, and make money at the same time. Can I, can I answer yep. that too? I'm yep. sorry. Please do. <laughs> uh, so yeah, next semester uh, we'll extend our, our free program. And in the spring, um, we will be under $10 per student per semester. Um, the students pay directly. They just go to the website, fill out a quick registration form, um, pop in their credit card, and they get this, they get this software. Uh, if, uh, if any schools want to have some other kind of an arrangement uh, where, they, where the school pays and we hand out vouchers, I'm perfectly happy to do that, and the price would be uh, significantly less than that. And that's all there is to it. And uh, I, I think one point I'd like to make is that, you know, it's a, I'm not going to say one model is better than the other. It's just which one's appropriate to you. Uh, but this is a model that does not, you know, does, does not add or, or duplicate um, potentially existing administrative activities. Which is to say, um, it's a lot simpler. Was there? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Sorry. Well, actually, if you don't mind, I saw I've been missing you. <laughs> Thank you. For the three of you that. Uh, when you say a problem with the disk, uh, somebody says they, they're going to print it out and there's nothing there. 
Uh, I see. Well, the first question is, is the person right an answer, as I said before? The, the second issue is, I, I think all of our programs have redundancies built into them that provide backups of the exam, that provide multiple means of retrieving it. I, I can speak for the re reliability of, of their systems, but uh, I'm sure they can. But, Thank you. Well, I can't, but, but, but I know in our instance, uh, we, we don't lose exams. There have been instances where people have made fatal errors uh, towards the end of their exams where they've deleted their entire answers or um, there was one school where their hardware died. But what we have gone and done in light of that is we have developed, I call, a set of anti-anxiety test-taking tools uh, which deal with the mistakes people make at the end of the tests that actually stop them from deleting their answer, uh, destroying their computer, and then doing other types of things. And uh, this has definitely proved scalable because we do bar exams where thousands of people uh, sit at the very same time uh, to take an exam. And we have shown that in groups of 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 people simultaneously at different places that um, while a disk might be handed in blank, that the exam is safe and intact and it's there. That's what exam soft has to deal with it. Do you, do you provide the personnel to make that recovery? Oh. Is there or is, is the local? Well, the, re the recovery is very simple. Um, we always leave encrypted copies of the exam on the student's computer, always, multiple copies. Um, so what you have is people taking their law school exams, leaving with copies of their exam on the computer, and you have people taking their bar exams and other tests, uh, which are very high stakes, leaving with encrypted copies of their exam on their computer because of human error. And while the person can see this copy, they can't open it, they can't move it, they can't alter it, etc. So all the school has to do is take it off the drive with tools that we give them, and then run it through the printing and scoring software, and, it, um, and, and they have their exam there, working from these backup copies. Uh, it sounds like we have very similar redundancies built into Secure Exam in the sense that we encrypt an extra copy onto the hard drive, which is retrievable but unalterable. Um, we also train the tech staff at all of our client sites to understand exactly how our application runs and how it works and what it operates with. Um, in general, our schools have shown or demonstrated a desire to support, to do the first level tier one support of our product themselves. We're happy to do whatever is necessary to support our schools. Um, we haven't lost any exams. I don't expect we ever will because we've built in so many redundancies, um, including pinpointing within the user manuals to the students what they should avoid doing, what they can do to avoid missteps like that. You know, making sure that we've built in all of the undo features within our word processor um, that we get from Microsoft Word. <coughs> and we haven't had a problem to date. Um, and we are always available to work with the schools to provide any assistance on any technical issue, not just that one. I, mean, I, I don't want to beleaguer that one, so I'm yeah. just say we're, we're, right. we're yeah. a subset of those answers. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. I mean, I, I, I'll put a a glass an overarch. I mean, exams are stressful. They're, uh, you know, it's not just your casual trip to the grocery store. Um, I, I think that the, the good news, if you're trying to, whatever, however you proceed, right, with exams, you've been doing exams a long, long time. I mean, the professor has to write it, and they submit it to the copy center ten minutes before the deadline or after the deadline. That's not a new issue, right? This is the true team application that you guys do in a law school. This is the best way you can come together taking advantage of any technology, however you approach it, because then it gets duplicated, then it gets sequenced, it gets handed off to your registration, you know, your student records office, whoever it is. It gets handed out, it gets taken. I mean, all those, you know, nobody thinks of it that way in those terms, but you're really pulling everybody together, and all we're really doing here, right, is you, you, you want to scale it as it's just one more step, and you want to make it simple and as, as customized for your environment that it makes sense. Don't let the technology drive this, right? Why not? Um, because because the point is you're there, I think, for legal education to take the exam. Yes, was it rhetorical? I'm sorry. Thank you. I caught it. I'm slow. <laughs> yes, sir. Or, Diane. Diane. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I missed it. Um, and I, I've been using ExamSoft for quite a few years at the law 
law school. And just to answer, I can't really show my app difference between, and, and forgive me guys if I don't think this correct, so just correct me, um, the difference between your two software secure exam and in Microsoft. I guess the, the, from my own experience, the fundamental difference is one, ExamSoft uses the own proprietary word processor um, with some of the same functions as, as Microsoft Word has, whereas SecureExam actually runs with um, Microsoft Word, okay. the version that they used to earlier. The printing functionalities are, are a little bit different. ExamSoft will uh, print directly from the floppy disk is quite handy that the students when they're in and in sit right to the floppy. We, the, the process that we run through, the floppy is taken right to the printing room, or it's all secure, most students can see Chinese exams. It prints um, secure exam. I'm, I'm a little, um, not quite exactly sure how it works, but to my understanding is that it uses, um, it, the way we deal with, you can explain it. sure, the way, we, we have a variety of models that different schools adopt with secure exam when it comes to printing. Most of our schools didn't want to have the student take the exam itself and go print it and then hand it out. They wanted to sort of avoid that process after the fact. Um, so what secure exam does is it enables the student to save one copy of the exam wherever the proctor indicates they should. In most of our schools, it's a wired environment. So they go onto the network and they put it on the drive and the faculty member or a TA or someone like that will print it out for the student. And so the whole examination process ends for the student at the end of the exam. Um, we do have some schools that have their students print directly to a central printing area. So one of the drivers that comes down at the end where it says, where do you want to save this, they save it to a printer. Um, but there are a variety of different ways it can be handled. Yeah, and again, the, another um, difference being that with ExamSoft, it's absolutely necessary that you can get off the web can put it on the CTA of the tech response to do that, for example, so I'll send it to you. But it does require registration on the web, uh, I believe twice, in fact, if I remember, you have to register and download it, and then once you install the program and run through what they call a qualification exam, you have to um, put in some codes um, that you have to get from the web. So, and secure exam, I don't believe you have to do that. You can just install it, and there's no qualification at the end, so you the students don't necessarily have to know how to do that. What, what, what Diane is talking about is when a student, um, when a school uh, uses our product, we allow them to control the distribution of the program. Uh, you know, we just don't say, students, come and get it. It's all yours. The school notifies the students that it's available for downloading and to have your machine checked and ready. And while the students are doing that, we're building a database for the school administrator to keep track of everything the students are doing. And so what Diane is talking about is the information the students put in so their administrator at the school can be sure that the student completed the process and they can allow them to go ahead and, and use the uh, exams for a computer. It's part of the quality control process uh, that we've put in place. I feel a little excluded from that oh. uh, okay. session of answers there. Okay. Um, but I think you saw my word processor is, uh, is, is just to answer two parts of your question, it's, re it's proprietary, it's a, it's a simple word processor, um, minimum of functions and bells and whistles, just what's needed to type an exam, because you're there to type an exam, not okay. do graphic design work. And then as far as the uh, download, also you saw, if you, if, you, if you saw me do it, I just, I, I had it on a floppy disk, and uh, so if you, if you don't even have access, you could, have it delivered to somebody else's email address, copy it onto a floppy, and then put it onto your computer. So it's pretty portable that way, and um, it definitely fits on a computer, on a, on a floppy disk. And I should add that it's, um, it's about a 600K download, so even on a 56K modem, um, you're talking about you know, two or three minutes. Uh, it's pretty quick. Okay. I'm sorry. I guess this is a question for, uh, for all four. We may not add on so much, but one of the attractions, what we use uh, the soft test exams on this uh, product, one of the attractions has been that the state bar of California has certified um, soft test for use on bar exams. So a lot of students are interested because they foresee using computers on the bar. Um, at Virginia, what, what, what is your state bar doing in terms of computer uh, use? And does that impact your decision to use or not to use any software? And I guess for Doug and for Greg, have you talked to any state bars in terms of certifying your software? 
Uh, mine's an easy answer. I don't know what the Virginia State Bar is using or what they intend to use. And I, I think I hearken back to it. I, I look at my job as, you know, how to do good computing from day one, which is, you know, it's not a real player, you know, video game. This is a work device. I mean, that's my, my ethos from, from day one. Um, so, they're, you know, they could use different kinds of testing software. I just want them to know what good computing practices are. Uh, with respect to software secure, we are talking with a number of different state boards, uh, state bars, um, and I expect we'll have some news on that front in the next couple months. Um, we're also talking with a number of medical board examiners and CFA examiners, secure examiners being used over a variety of different markets. Um, and so there's a lot of confidence in the product itself and a lot of sort of comfort in the way it, it works. And I'll say that you know you, you know that the bars are very conservative organizations, and there's no way they're going to put all their eggs in one basket. So uh, we're anticipating some good conversations with them as well. points there. I think if the, the assumption is if you're going to, if you're not going to say bring out your pencil and paper and leave your notebook at home for the exam administration, right. the assumption is it's open book. So the issue of cutting and pasting is, okay, everybody's got a notebook, everybody's got, you know, your notes are all organized and hypertext and whatnot, here we go. Um, so that, I, I'm not imagining is it. Um, the way the triage would work, I mean, again, my, my point is I work with the, the, the uh, the student records folks and the exam administrators up to a point of, you know, do I feel confident that I've rescued the disc, that what the, you know, what the, how the student said they took the exam, does, does that make sense? And if at that point, you know, it goes above and beyond or whatever, that, that's where I'm, I drop off the picture, right? That, that's a specialist point of view, so I don't see how far that goes up the tree and whatnot. So closed book exams are not used, doesn't, do not use this model. The honor code doesn't cover the closed book uh, if you're going to do a closed book, they would tell you to not, you know, we're just saying leave your notebook at home and handwrite. You wouldn't use the honor code? To um, some professors do. I mean, that, that's the professors. I mean, we can just educate them that, you know, if you say bring your notebook, got a handwrite, and don't actually access your hard drive, right. you understand what you just said. But that professor is in charge. You know what percentage are open and closed? You said a professor Most can. Open. Most 70%, 90%. I don't see. I, I mean, when I'm reading the exam instructions, I'm looking for when is it, when's it start, how long is it, um, and is it multiple choice? What kind? I mean, I'm looking you think at most. I think are most open. are most are most are using their they're using the notebook. I'm assuming most are open book, open notes. But I'm not reading that the exam instruction cover sheet itself to know what, what they're saying. Some professors have started to, to break it up, where you know there's a part of it where leave your notebooks all off. They come in at halfway through. And they collect part A, if you will, and then it opens up. I mean, you know, that, that's the kind of thing where they can mix and match as long as they understand the issues that are involved. And remember, we've got wireless going on here, too, so it's not even, you know, can you be doing Westlaw research or Lexus research in the middle? I mean, you could have cell phones and pagers, and, you know, I mean, they need to understand these issues and then we move forward with it. Mm -hmm. Could each of you describe how your products Specific uh, take home exam and says bring it in when the exam period opens, but you, you have a certain amount of time over the next two days to work on this exam and then bring it in. There's some time sensitivity to it. Do either of any of your products support, support that? You want to go first? 
Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, mine definitely does. Uh, what you would do is um, announce that start code that I put in there at the beginning of the exam. Uh, announce that right when you want the exam to start. Uh, make it available. Either send it out as an email or post it on your office door, uh, and they can they can get started with that one. Um, if you need a, if you need a, a code just for that one exam, I'll definitely provide it. So. Um, and then the log sheets that come with the, with the exam will show the total time, all their starting and stopping. Um, or if they actually they're not, with, for the exam you're talking about, they wouldn't be able to start and stop, so uh, they'd just be able to use it the once. And um, just as straightforward as can be. Would they be able to take it at different times as long as they, they have to all start at the same time? Well, okay, so they can they can start whenever they whenever they would want, after okay. the time you yeah, announce their you, the code. That'll work fine. But you can't do it in 10 minute increments. Right. right. Uh, well, at least under that one. Yeah. All right. Uh, let, let me start by telling you what Secure Exam does not do for that particular environment. Um, and I don't know about the other products, maybe we can talk about it. Um, other than the use of user IDs and passwords, without a proctor, we can't authenticate the user. We are working on a couple issues that will help that, but today, can authenticate that if Adam was supposed to take the exam, it was Adam that took the exam. It was Adam in front of the computer, other than the fact that he had the right user IDs and the password. The other thing Secure Exam does not do is it cannot tell you, the instructor, that I didn't have someone else sitting next to me giving me the answers, telling me what to type. And it doesn't prevent me from using a second computer next to my computer. Okay, so those are issues that you have to think about if you're security conscious but you want to give some sort of a secure testing environment. Okay. What we do do is um, we provide the ability for a faculty member to determine how long a student should be in the exam. And either they can just tell the student you've got three hours, and at the end of each exam we post various statistics including how long they were in the exam. Or you can actually have the exam shut down automatically after a certain period of time. Um, if you are sending them an exam or giving them an exam electronically, other than just having a blank word processing screen in which they type the answer, um, you can give them the access code they need to get into it whenever you want so you can sort of control their access. Um, the bottom line is what Secure Exam does do in a, in a non proctored environment is it tells you that the student couldn't use their testing computer, the computer they used, to cheat. They're not going to get an unfair advantage from being able to access pre-existing information or content online and be able to cut and paste. Or get extra time. Or get extra time. If they could get extra help, which they can do and take those now anyway. That's right. Um, yeah, I have an answer. And I can actually talk by way of example, but um, in deference to these two gentlemen, I think, uh, Steve, your question really gets into program specifics. And as a competitive nature, we don't share them with each other. And I just want to say to you and Greg, I respect the information you're sharing uh, with everyone. And it's not something you'll see in exam soft in a month or two. That's how we do things. And I hope we'll have the same mutuality. The same thing, uh, the best thing I can do is uh, tell you by example how we handle this. Because we work with two schools. One is the first online law school which does not have a campus, which has the issue of giving secure exams at home. Uh, and in order to get their accreditation with the state bar, they need to be able to demonstrate that their standards and their rigors are as high as the other schools in California. And then the second uh, example I can give you is we are doing a, a new special admissions program for a, a law school in South Florida that is allowing people to come into the law school who have very low LSAT scores and very low GPAs, and they're admitting these people through uh, giving a course online and making them take exams at home at the end of every week. Um, and we've really come to specialize in these types of creative uh, take-home exams. Um, the answer to your question, the big answer to your question is yes. Uh, with our program, what we can control by example you have a take-home exam, you want to give the person three hours over a four-day window to complete it. And after that time, they can't work on the exam anymore. 
we give each of our school an authoring program, which lets you set up the environs for these exams. So what you would be able to do is code this exam so uh, the student would not be able to start until a specific time. And then they would have to conclude within a specific time. And that exam can be completely secure, where they cannot access anything out on the drive, where we maintain complete control over their network at home. Uh, and it's very important because a lot of these people do have very good networking capabilities at home. And while some programs may lock out a drive, uh, they don't deal with the bandwidth coming in and out of the computer, uh, which circumvents the whole thing. This was a, a big challenge for the online universities, which we've accomplished. The second thing which we can provide you with is you can't stop someone from uh, getting up and picking up a book off their shelf for a take-home exam. Uh, it's just not possible. But what we can do is you can set this take-home exam up that you can give the student access to everything out there in the universe. But we prevent them from taking any of that information and cutting and pasting it into their exam or using it in their exam. So you're giving them a creative learning environment. You're saying search the web, do whatever you want, but your answer has to be in, in your own words, which teachers think is, uh, is extremely important. The third thing we deal with is the returning of the examinations and the chain of custody. Uh, we want to make sure that the student received that exam at home and they started it and they can't say, I didn't take the exam, I didn't do it. So we authenticate the user at the beginning of the exam and when the exam is returned online, when the exam is returned to the school, the school receives an electronic receipt notification of that and at the same time the student also receives an electronic notification at home. So what we've really done has covered the gambit of the types of exams people want to give at home. And then, uh, just so you know, ExamSoft has a proctor network of 7,000 proctors. So if you ever wanted to send a proctor to your student's home to make sure they weren't doing that, uh, <laughs> we can make that available for you too. Well, we have just a few more moments. Uh, and then we certainly have dinner. Got a long walk to get there. I can there. answer. <laughs> oh. No. Sorry? I'm just spouting. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll start. Well, with, with ExamSoft, what we've done is we've built an online application that actually checks the machine for the school and sends notification to the school that the machine's been checked and that it works properly. In terms of plugs, it really depends how long your tests are going to be. If your exams are an hour, you can run it off battery. But anything more than an hour, you have to have electricity. It, re it really does add an, an element of uh, uncertainty um, that you just don't, I don't think you want to have happening. And uh, you can see in a room like this, you know, there's a plug at every, at every, for every station. Uh, it's just something that's going to have to happen at some point. Remember the first year we did this at Hastings in 95? Uh, they actually came out there with extension cords and duct tape and just duct taped this network of, uh, of uh, junction boxes to the, to the floor. That's what we have been doing. Our rooms were junction. Yeah. yeah. There were some questions about, you know, the, could the generator take it? And, you know, what, what are we doing to the grid? But it, uh, but it, it worked. And those were the days of 20-minute batteries. Yeah. What law school are, are you with? In Austin? Okay. Bingo. That was right on time. Thank you very I have, much. Uh, I, have, I have copies of my software. If anybody would like one, uh, just come see me. That would be great. Yeah.